Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, I'm sure you all had a pretty busy day, so we appreciate you taking the time to learn more about on-campus housing here at Seattle University. So really quickly, um, we are just gonna do some quick introductions of myself and my colleague, Katie, here, just so you have an idea of who's in this space and who's talking to you today about the on-campus Red Hawk residential experience here at Seattle U. Uh, so my name is Tyler Murphy, he, him pronouns. I serve as the Assistant Director of Housing Operations and Occupancy in our Housing and Residence Life Central Office. So in my, in my service and my work to our students here, I oversee all of our occupancy management on campus, room assignments, billing, uh, move in and move out communication and processes and bigger picture processes like that for occupancy. Um, I've been here at Seattle U uh, for, our, for about four and a half years. It'll be five years in October. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I will hand it over to Katie. Thank you so much, Tyler. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie DeVridney. I use she, her, and they, them pronouns, and I serve as one of our area coordinators uh, for campus. So what that means is I oversee one of our halls um, as a first-year incoming student. Um, we'll talk about some of the different residence halls that are available to you, um, and I work in one of them called Campion Hall. Um, and so I oversee the community. I work with the resident assistants who you will meet in the fall. Um, and that's a little, little bit about me. I've been here for a couple of years. Uh, it was two years in March. Yeah, and I'm gonna pass it back over to Tyler. Great, thank you, Katie. Um, just a couple of quick little things before we get started with our more formal presentation here. Um, for those of you who had the chance to join us for one of our admitted student days or one of our preview days uh, that we held, or that the university, I should say, held in fall and winter. Um, some of this information may be a little bit of repeat information for you. However, we recognize that between now and then, some new questions may have developed. So you're still welcome to stay in this space, um, but the information may or may sound, may or may not sound familiar if you did join us with one of those events. Um, if you happen to have any questions, we do ask that you please put them in the chat. Uh, at the end of our formal presentation, which will take about like 20, 25 minutes, uh, we will look at those questions and we will answer them in the order that they've been submitted. Um, once we have exhausted that list of questions, you are welcome to add more or you're welcome to unmute and speak your question as well, whatever you're more comfortable doing in this space. Um, again, questions go in the chat or you're welcome to unmute once we're done with our presentation. And we are gonna go ahead and get started. All right, if you cannot see that, please let me know in the chat, but that should be available for everyone. Great, so we are gonna go ahead and move to the next slide. Okay. Perfect. All right, so again, um, we are here to talk about living on campus and what we like to call the Red Hawk residential experience and what that is like on the Seattle University campus. So our hope today is that after you learn more about living on campus, you'll really um, understand that what we have quoted here on this page, home is a feeling and it's not a place, right? So what we're hoping that you take away from this experience is that living on campus at Seattle University is what we like to call a signature experience, a signature Red Hawk experience, because not only will you be obviously physically living away from home, but there is so much more opportunity for you to be able to make friends, find your sense of belonging, and really find your place, not only on the Seattle University campus, but also in your particular residence hall where you're gonna be living for the next nine or 10 months. So that's really our hope um, after we end our session today. So we'll go ahead and move on. Um, again, we did a couple of quick introductions. We did have some other individuals who were not able to be here today. Hillary Lickerman does serve as our Director of Housing and Residence Life. Tim Albert is our Associate Director of Housing Services. And Katie Steele is our Associate Director of Community Engagement and Learning Initiatives. Um, so all of those individuals make up what we call our leadership team here in the department. Um, and we do have different focused areas, whether that be the Red Hawk Residential Experience or Housing Operations and Occupancy. So we'll continue on. All right, so just a really quick welcome. Again, thank you for making the time to be here with us to talk about housing. 
Um, housing at Seattle University is definitely rooted in our Jesuit traditions, our Catholic Jesuit traditions, where the university is committed to the education of the whole person. So this idea of holistic student development and holistic living and learning, and we take that experience outside of the classrooms and we really um, incorporate that into what the living residential experience looks like, right? So what we aim to do is we aim to ensure that all of our students really have that sense of belonging and the ability to make friends, understanding that some students may be coming here knowing a couple of people, knowing a lot of people, or there may be individuals that don't know anyone. And that can be an overwhelming experience. We recognize that. But we are committed to ensure that your transition into the residence halls at, during your first year experience or your transfer, transfer experience, if you're coming in as a transfer, is as smooth as possible. And not only your academic transition, but the social transition as well. So um, what does living on campus look like and what does that support look like as a whole? We really value and foster personal connections. So again, making friends or just getting along with roommates, right? Like building those interpersonal connections is something that we really um, strive to hold to a very top tier. Community membership and participation. We hold multiple events for students to be able to meet one another, especially at the beginning of the year after people, after our students move in. Um, that's something that, you know, we were heavy at the beginning of the year, but it also, you'll find events throughout the year all the way through spring um, for fall, winter, and spring quarters. Another thing that we highlight, the it's the convenience and the proximity to academic and campus services, right? So you can't get much closer to your classrooms, the library, the dining areas, downtown Seattle, it's just right, right there down the street. Um, you can't get much closer than living on campus. Um, and in addition to all the amenities and the closeness to your academics and the social participation that you can have, we also want to highlight that we have care for residential students. So um, we care about all of our residents that live here. We care about your transition to, to housing and college in general or to a new institution if you're a transfer student. Um, so we do have care built into how we operate and what we do as a department within the Seattle University landscape. So rest assured, you will be cared for and your transition to college, academic, academic base, social base, however we can best support you is gonna be at the very top tier of how we're gonna welcome you in September. So I'll pass it on to Katie for our next slide here. Awesome. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we call the Red Hawk residential experience. We at Seattle University, we are the Red Hawks. And so we created um, over the past few years, we, we have created uh, an experience called Red Hawk residential experience. So what is that? Um, it is a sequenced approach uh, that we take to just sequencing your experience um, to student success and learning. It's, uh, it's how we go about supporting you outside of the classroom. So the emphasis, um, there's a few different things that go into that. Um, our emphasis is on our first and second year students, which I believe everyone in the room is a first year student. So we're focusing pretty hard on you all and the residential experience that you are gaining while you are living with us. Um, I believe Tyler mentioned it about our two year live on requirement. And if you're going to be here, then we really want it to be worth it for you. Um, and so, with that, we're creating an environment that supports your learning, your academic success, your identity exploration, uh, just everything that goes into creating uh, a whole a holistic experience for you. Um, so some of the things that go into that is, um, in addition to our first and second year students, we are, of course, incorporating our upperclassmen in that as well. And we're connecting you to resources. There's always programs going on. We call them community connections because we want to engage and connect with our communities. Um, and in addition to that, we're also creating services to enhance learning, development, and just the feeling of community and in, in particular belonging within your community. Um, since fitting in and belonging are two different things, and we really want you to feel like you belong at Seattle University. Um, so we're creating policies and programs that encourage your personal development responsibilities. Um, um, that is where your resident assistance will really come into play here. Um, as they're the ones creating uh, the bulletin boards and the events that you can attend. And there's always something going on in the building or on campus. There are events across campus your RAs will try to take you to. Um, excuse me, sorry. Um, and sorry, going back on that. 
But your RAs are always hard at work creating these experiences with you. They will always take time to really try to connect with you on an individual level as well. Um, and just learning more about you as a person and just kind of try to figure out like, okay, so a lot of people on my floor really enjoy doing competitions and well, that's something that we'll do for our floor. And so we are curating that experience for you. And so with that all said, uh, it's to make your on-campus experience meaningful and fun. We want you to have fun while you're here. Um, I, would, I might also offer that your experience is what you make of it too. Uh, the more you put into it, the more you'll get out of it. Um, and so we do invite you to engage with us as your RAs are putting together events for you. Please come attend these events because they're they want to create um, experiences for you to connect with one another, for you to develop, um, and just really find your niche while you're here on campus with us. I'm going to pass it back to Tyler. Yes, thank you. So because of the multiple benefits, right, of living on campus that years of research and experience have shown to be true, uh, Seattle University does have a residential policy or requirement where all first year students and second year students, um, including first year transfers and second year transfers are required to live on campus. Um, again, based on what Katie had mentioned, this idea of sequence learning, you know, one year living on campus is great. It's beneficial. It's definitely vital for students who are transitioning to college for the first time. And we want to take that a step further for that second year because there's so much more opportunity to build on the skills that students have learned in the living in community and the residence halls for their first year that they can use to welcome our first year students for their second year. So all first year and second year students are required to live on campus. Uh, we do have an exemption policy and procedure to where if you do uh, live within about roughly a 20 to 30 mile radius and you'd like to commute, um, that is something that you can reach out to our office to if you'd like to pursue that. Um, but first year and second year students are required to live on campus and purchase the residential meal plan at minimum for those first and second years of enrollment. And we'll go ahead and move on. All right, awesome. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about our staff since I name dropped the resident assistants not too long ago and I'll go into a little bit more about who, like, what, who we are and who you will be interacting with. And so first things first, our professional staff. Um, professional staff include people like Tyler in our central office as well as myself, um, our, one of our area coordinators. Um, in addition to the area coordinators, we also have our assistant area coordinators who are graduate level uh, students who are serving in the residence halls in a very similar capacity as I am. And our whole role centers on supporting our community from a bird's eye view. Um, and we work with the resident assistant staff. We, uh, we are the direct supervisors for our RAs. Now, depending on which building you live in and which floor you live on, uh, you will have one to two RAs on your floor. Um, your R whole RA's job is to look out for you. Um, they are, as I mentioned, creating events. They're uh, getting to know you on a personal level. They're looking out for your well-being as well. Um, they help make sure that you understand what the policies are within the building. Um, if someone is having a really difficult time, they're one of the first people that will connect you with who, uh, someone else who can help, depending on what you need. Um, their mentors, their resources, um, they're educators, um, and they're also uh, there to enforce university policies as well. So just something to keep in mind. And again, and if emergency arises, they are one of the first people that you will see on, like, on scene. Um, another team that you will see is your desk staff. So our desk assistants, as well as our desk coordinator, they're the ones providing that excellent customer service at the front desk, be that I have a question about where to go or how do I get my mail? The desk assistants are there uh, and they're more than happy to help you. They're friendly faces, some of the first people that you'll meet, um, and there are also resources for you. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have resident ministers and Jesuits in residence. Uh, Tyler talked a little bit about um, our Jesuit values, and we do have Jesuits who live in the building. Um, and I, um, in each of our areas, we work with our resident ministers, both to create programming and also just to um, support our communities. They're not priests, uh, but they are there. Um, a lot of our resident ministers have other roles on campus, be that professors working in other offices. And they are there to support you um, to really whichever capacity you need. They're they usually um, they're considered confidential uh, listening resources if you just need to talk about something. 
Um, and they're also very well resourced as well. Um, to name a specific example, our resident minister in Campion Hall is a professor on campus. And so she's very well connected within the, within the academic world. And so all in all, we have a really robust team that is excited to serve, excited to meet you and excited to work with you and help you transition into college and help you cre really curate that experience. And I'm going to pass it back over to Tyler, I believe. Yeah, so just to highlight um, a little bit more about what Katie mentioned, this Red Hawk residential experience. So a big takeaway from today's presentation is this, when you live on campus, you will be part of what we call the Red Hawk residential experience that essentially works to ensure that um, you, we support you in your individual connections, whether that be making friends or ensuring that you have a, a good relationship with your roommate or roommates, your floor mates, or really just the building as a whole. Um, you're gonna be part of this larger community and we wanna help you understand how you fit into, let's say the overall Campion community and then how you fit into the floor community. And then when you're in your space with your roommate, like what does that look like? So we're here to support you in that sense. And then again, the RAs, the resident assistants, they are student staff that live on all of our floors. Um, they're there to help to connect you to clubs, events, um, any support, resources that you may need on campus, whether that be internal to our department or anything external, uh, they are there to support you and to ensure that you are getting the support and the help that you may need throughout the year. Um, and on top of all of the other staff that Katie had mentioned that either live directly in our residence halls um, or are here to support you in our central office. <clears throat> and we will continue on and I'll yeah. pass it to Katie. Yeah, awesome. So let's talk a little bit about our, our residence hall association and our hall council. So if you are looking to get involved on campus and want to do so from the comfort of your home, this is a really great uh, thing to keep in mind when you get here in the fall. So the RHA or the residence hall association is the student governing body for residence halls. While they are also putting on programming, they're also advocates for the community. Um, if you've ever been in student government, this is a very, very similar model. We have a president, vice president, chair of finance, and so on. Um, they're advocates for the community. They connect with the student, um, Seattle University student government. Um, and so they're also, they also have a voice in the community as well. So that is one way for you to get involved, as well as the hall councils, where if you want to be the, like one of the faces of your community, you don't particularly want to work in the same capacity as a resident assistant or a de desk assistant, but you want to get involved, get to know your community, host really fun events, um, then this is another great way for you to get involved. And so they'll, these student leaders, whereas your uh, resident assistants will plan smaller events for your floor specifically, the hall councils are gonna do big events for the building. And residence hall association will take that a step further and do big events for the whole campus as well. A really great example being casino night. That is an annual tradition that happens in our ballroom and it's a big blowout event. It's so much fun. If um, and you're here in January, you, I highly recommend coming. It's so much fun. Um, tote bag decorating for something a little more low key. And so those are just a few of the events that RHA hosts each year and some of our tra uh, traditions. Um, and yeah, so I have the pleasure, whereas I don't work um, as an area coordinator, I don't advise RHA, but I do get to see, uh, I do get to work with them kind of indirectly um, and just watch them work hard and get to interact with them and attend their events. And it's truly, truly so much fun. Um, I hope you will check it out when you get here in the fall. All right, so now that we have given you a general overview of who we are and what we do to support you as a resident on campus, uh, I will be talking about some more of the specific logistics of housing for our students, whether you are coming in as a first year student or a transfer. So residence hall options, if you are starting at Seattle University in the fall as a first year student, uh, the options, the community options that you have are Bellarmine, Campion, and Xavier Halls. We consider these to be traditional style residence halls in the sense that, uh, you know, it's communal style living where each floor we have co-ed, each floor we have co-ed floors. Uh, we do have um, uh, male identified and female identified bathrooms on each floor as well. Um, two of the pictures here, you can see uh, Bellarmine at the top and Campion towards the bottom. Um, we have 
Campion is our largest residence hall with about 650 residents total. Bellarmine is our second largest with about roughly four to 450 residents. And then Xavier, if you're looking for a smaller community, Xavier is going to be probably where you'd like to make your preference on your housing application because that community has about 180 residents. So Campion, Bellarmine, and Xavier from largest to smallest. Um, but that is primarily where all of our first year students live. After your first year, because again, uh, we do have a two-year housing requirement, your sophomore or your second year of enrollment, you are eligible to live again in Bellarmine, Campion, and Xavier because those are mixed residence halls between first year and second year students. But then you'll also have the option to live in Chardon Hall, which is all suite style living. And then we do have a select amount of apartments in our Murphy apartments for sophomores um, to choose from as well in our continuing student room selection process that you'll get plenty of information about once you, um, after you start here at, in your first year. And then we do have limited housing available for um, once you reach your junior and senior years. We have the Colvinbach houses, we have the Yobi apartments, we have uh, the majority of our Murphy apartments are for junior and senior students. And then we also have two affiliated partner communities um, that house primarily and solely Seattle University students. Those are gonna be the Douglas Apartments and the Vi Hilbert Apartments as well. So this is just a general overview of your housing journey from year one to year four um, and what you can look forward to. And then we will move on to what's in a room. So we have, we gave you a layout of all of the three main communities. So what does a room look like? So each student in a residence hall room has a bed, a desk and a chair, a wardrobe and a bulletin board. Uh, we also wanna highlight that all of our residence hall rooms come equipped with a sink, a micro fridge, and a highlight that we like to say is that all of our furniture is modular. What that means is nothing is bolted into the walls or into the ground. So you, once you get here with your roommate, you can figure out if you wanna maybe move a wardrobe over here or put your beds over here or bunk them, whatever's gonna be most comfortable and convenient for you two or three, um, that is something that you're able to discuss and move. So nothing is bolted into the ground, which is great. Um, you don't have to worry about purchasing a mini fridge or a microwave because again, all of our rooms come with micro fridges, which is essentially uh, a mini fridge with a little freezer with a microwave bolted onto the top. So it's essentially three in one that you don't have to worry about. And then again, a sink is located in every room. So let's say in the morning, you just wanna quickly brush your teeth, wash your face before going to class. You don't have to go all the way to the bathroom to do that. Um, you can just do that in your room, which is great. There's also a mirror up at the top. And then the sink also has a little um, storage unit, two, two cabinets underneath. So those are just some things we'd like to highlight. And then moving on to, I believe, amenities. Yes. So in addition to what's in a room, these are some other um, amenities that we like to highlight in sessions like these. So as Katie mentioned, we do have front um, service desk operations that are staffed by our student staff, our desk assistants. Um, so mail and packages, that's all gonna be sorted through the front desk of each residence hall. So students don't have to go to like a main central hub on campus to get their mail. It's all within their residence hall front desk. Uh, service, the front desk also offers services like lockout assistance, general emergency response. If someone needs to report like a leak or something that needs service in their room, urgent service, the front desk can be a point of, of support there. Um, all of our residence halls and apartments have ethernet and Wi-Fi wi options. The majority of our students do use the Wi-Fi network, which is high speed and it works great with homework and streaming, Netflix and all that good stuff. But if you would prefer to use ethernet, we do also have that ability as well. Uh, computer and printing services. There are many computer labs in our residence halls as well as printers. If you'd like to print out homework or readings, whatever it is that you may need to print, you don't have to go far for that. Um, study lounges and study spaces also exist in our residence halls um, as well as in our apartments. We have laundry facilities um, in all of our residence halls. And what's great about our particular laundry facilities is that it's all coinless. It's all through an app that you download on your phone. So no need to have to worry about 
getting quarters or carrying them or losing them. It's all through an app based on your phone that your resident assistant can help um, help you load that onto your phone and get you set up there. Uh, we do also have community kitchens. So again, all first year students do need to purchase the residential meal plan. However, if there are times where you want to make a meal with friends or you want to make like a quick snack and you uh, need some sort of kitchen to do that, there are community kitchens on all of our floors in Bellarmine Campion and Xavier for you to use. Um, we have music and game rooms that you can use as well. Um, our front desk also uh, we'll loan you, um, rent out with your student ID card games. If you want to play games with people, uh, other residents or friends in your hall, on your floor, maybe your roommate, you're welcome to do that. And then finally, we do just want to highlight that we do have custodial and maintenance services in case anything does need service in your room. Um, we do have a very quick turnaround for all of our custodial and maintenance services. They do a great job with repairing anything that needs repair or anything that may need service or replacement. They are a really, really great campus partner to have. And a lot of our students are very happy and satisfied with the service that they do provide. Um, so we, we did just wanna give them a shout out and highlight them here as well. We will continue on. Um, so really quickly about housing preferences and roommates. So the housing portal is gonna be your one-stop shop when it comes to anything housing related for requests or applying for housing. Um, so that's that's another big takeaway we want you all to, to know from this session. Uh, you all should all, you all, you all already should have access to the housing portal. Um, if you haven't already submitted your housing application, uh, the deadline advertised was June 1st, but we are still taking applications. So please get that in as soon as possible. Uh, we are currently now in the next phase of our first year housing process, and that's gonna be the roommate selection process. Um, so between now and July 15th, you do have the ability, if you've already formally submitted an application, you can log on to the housing portal and reopen your 2024, 2025 housing application. And one of the available options to you in your completed application now is gonna to be to search for a roommate. Um, in the application, if you've already applied, you probably remember a page that you filled out that asked you about your lifestyle and living habits. So what time do you wake up? What time do you go to sleep? How clean do you like your room? What's your activity level? Meaning, do you plan to stay in your room a lot or do you plan to be out and about? And essentially that page is used to help try to find you a roommate. And you can essentially what we call shop around for a roommate. You can see how others match up with your answers. You can message people, have conversations back and forth before you formally make um, a decision to create what we call a roommate group. Uh, to which signals to us in our office that you want to live together with one person or another person if you're looking at a triple plus. Um, and we will place you together in, in one of your preferred residence halls. So uh, it's definitely not required. Um, however, it's highly encouraged. But if you're not able to find a roommate or that's not something that you want to do, that's totally fine. We will use your questionnaire from your application to find you a roommate on your behalf. A um, couple of other things here. If you specifically know a student that you want to live with, at, let's say you're coming from high school and you have a friend you want to live with, or you've met someone through one of these orientation sessions or just coming to campus, you're also able to find that particular person by their username uh, or their email address, their Seattle U email address as well. Um, you don't have to necessarily search for someone. You do have the ability to just enter that person's credentials to create that roommate group. So again, this is something that is exciting. You're able to find someone, even if you're not able to, even if you're in conversation with someone and you think, hey, I don't think this person would be a good compatible roommate for me, you still might be able to make a friend before you even get here because you might be able to continue the conversation. And while you may mutually think we may not be great roommates, we could probably be great friends, right? So I would still encourage you to shop around and see if you can start talking to people, uh, other students who are coming in just like you in the same boat. And we will continue on. Um, and then just quickly, we wanted to touch on Red Hawk Dining. So uh, we do have six retail locations across campus for students to purchase meals, whether that be full meals or quick snacks if you're on the go. 
Uh, we do have about, um, we do have menus that represent quality, variety, and flexibility, uh, as well as value, right? So we understand that this is where you're going to be eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner, as well as snacks in between. So that's definitely a partnership that we have with our dining colleagues to take feedback from students, to see how we can enhance our menu, how we can enhance our hours of operation, and really just hear student feedback in general to see what, what is it that you want to enjoy out of the dining experience here on campus. Um, items are priced a la carte, so students can choose what they desire. The way that our meal plan system works here is that it's a dollar for dollar value, declining balance, or we compare it like a debit card. So whatever meal plan you choose, that's how much will be loaded onto your card every quarter. And so whatever you purchase, it's gonna be whatever that dollar value is and your balance will decline um, through the end of the quarter. We do have a rollover policy. So from fall to winter and winter to spring, a maximum of $250 left over will roll over to the next quarter. Everything over that does get forfeited. So we do encourage you to monitor your spending and ensure that you're roughly about 250 over, um, if you are over at all, just so that way you do get those funds moving forward. Um, at the end of the year, at the end of the spring quarter, all funds are forfeited. So definitely at the end of spring, we wanna make sure that you're getting as close to zero as possible. Um, there's also some bulk options that you can get if you'd like to do that, if you live local um, to the to campus or Seattle, that's also something that we will provide you information on at that time. Um, and again, a meal plan is required for all first and second year students living on campus or for our second years living in affiliated housing, the Douglas Apartments or by Hilbert. Uh, you are required to have the residential meal plan at minimum, but if you want to go up to our expanded or maximum options, you're welcome to do that. And then moving forward. Uh, really quickly, just to wrap up before we open it up to questions. These are um, some dates that we have listed here. These are all on our website, so no need to memorize these at all. Uh, based on where we're at in our first year housing timeline and process, the next big milestone is gonna be that July 15th date. If you do wanna search for a roommate, that is the deadline to formally create your roommate group on the housing portal. Uh, July 30th is gonna be a second big milestone. Uh, that's when all of our assignments are going to be released. So July 30th, definitely stick by your Seattle University email account uh, by 4 p.m. Pacific time or before that um, to see where you're going to be living and who you're going to be living with. And then early August, August 5th, we will be sending you move-in information, uh, particularly information about selecting your move-in appointment. There's nothing you have to do at this time about that. Um, again, early August, we will be sending you information about move in, arrival, check in, early arrival requests, all of those details. And then um, September 21st, that's another last thing I want to highlight here. That's the big day. That is our move in for all of our new students. It's Saturday, September 21st. So that is going to be a date that if you haven't marked already, that's definitely going to be a, a travel date for you um, to move into campus housing. And with that, I believe that is our, yes. That is our last slide here. So uh, thank you for listening to our presentation. We do still have about 25 minutes. So again, if you have any questions that you want to put in the chat, you're welcome to write them, or you can also unmute and just ask your question as well. So we will be here until all of your questions are answered. Thank you, Dr. All right, we do have a question in the chat. Let's see here. So I'm just gonna read out loud. Is the, in the available reading, I understood I had to vacate the room every term. Is this correct? Or can I leave my things over Christmas or from term to term? You wanna take that one, Tyler? Sure, yeah, I can take that. So thank you for your question. Um, so the only time that students have to vacate their space is actually gonna be that winter break period. So right after the fall quarter, before winter quarter starts for the holiday season, uh, that's when our residence halls do close for winter break. However, if you would like to continue to live on campus, we do have winter break housing. Um, that is supplemental housing, and that's a different application process. 
Um, so it is available. We understand students may not be able to travel during that time period, or they um, just prefer to stay on campus because they have a job that they, in the local area that they want to continue to work at for that period of time, that's totally okay. Um, but that is the only advertised time that you do have to vacate your space. Spring break, uh, you do not have to vacate your space. You're welcome to stay. The At the end of the year, of course, when the year is over, that's when all students uh, move out of the residence halls for summer. But between fall and spring, so the entire academic year, the only time you have to vacate is that winter break period. All right. Uh -huh. We've got a few questions that just popped up. Um, next one is, are we assigned a time to sign up for housing or does Seattle University just assign new students? Yeah, so thank you for your question. Um, so if you're coming in as a first year student, we will assign your housing and that's based on your preferences that you list in your housing application. So your community preference, right? Bellarmine, Campion and Xavier, your roommate preference and your room type preference. So do you wanna, do you prefer to live in a double, a double plus or a triple plus? So we take all of that information holistically and we try to find the best possible assignment for you. So there's nothing you have to necessarily do except apply for housing. So if you've already done that, great. If you have, you just got to sit tight um, until July 30th and you'll find out your housing assignment. Awesome. Next question. I forgot if you covered this or not, but what if I don't get along with that with my roommate? I can take this one. So we have a process for when we have roommate disagreements or roommate conflicts. Um, and so the first thing, first things first with a roommate conflict is uh, a meeting with your resident assistant. Um, as there's a variety of reasons why roommates may not get along, uh, Tyler talked about some of the compatibility pieces of bedtime, cleanliness. Um, and in my own experience, that's um, a lot of things that come up during roommate conflicts. So um, the first step would be meeting with your resident assistant saying, hey, this is what's going on. This is what I'm seeing. This is how it's making me feel. Um, and your RA will work with you uh, as well as your roommate at after a certain point. I'll get to, I'll get to that part um, on how to work through conflicts. As many roommate conflicts can be worked through with a with a conversation. And I understand um, conflict can be uncomfortable. It can feel scary, um, but it's also an important life skill to be able to talk to people about what's bothering you. Of like, hey, when this happens. This is how it makes me feel. Is this is there? Could we do things like this from now on? And your RA will work with you on that. They receive extensive training on how to work through roommate conflicts. Um, and depending on how that conversation goes, if you feel comfortable going back to talk to your roommate, great. We empower you to do so. Um, or we may move into the direction of a roommate mediation, where at which point either if you want to connect with your roommate directly on it, or your RA will reach out to your roommate to kind of learn more about their side, because we don't want to blindside anyone with, hey, we're meeting with the RA, out of res just out of respect for one another. And what those conversations usually look like is it's a facilitated conversation of just um, helping you talk to each other in a healthy manner to work through conflicts like that. Um, in my experience, that can be really powerful. Um, of just learning how to have healthy dialogues about what's bothering you or, hey, when the room is left in this state, this is how it feels. I feel this certain way about bringing friends over and just kind of working through that because your roommate cannot help you if they don't know what's wrong. And so it's very important to learn how to talk through and have those conversations. Now, that said, um, sometimes there are issues that arise that can't be worked through. We recognize that that happens. Um, at which point we do have a room uh, a room change process that would involve going and submitting a room change request through the housing portal. Now, um, with room change requests, it's not a guarantee. They are requests um, and it does depend on availability of alternate alternative spaces. And so what I may offer is that we can never guarantee a better roommate situation. We can't guarantee a worse one, but we can't guarantee a better one. So just be aware that there is some risk um, in pursuing a room change. So. That's kind of a quick and dirty um, rundown of what happens with the roommate conflict. Um, Tyler, the next question is, how do you access your Seattle U email? Yeah, so the, the easiest way probably to answer this in terms of navigation, um, if you're familiar with the Seattle University website, once you get to the website on the top user bar, uh, there should be a button that's called Quick Links. So if you get to the Quick Links tab, one of the options there should be um, your email. So that's one way to log in. Um, if you are familiar with MySU for looking at financial aid packages, 
um, or letters, official communication from the university, that's that same area. So you'll be able to log in and access your email from there. Thank you. I wasn't sure how to answer that one. Uh, the next question is, what is the culture of each of the dorms like? Um, I will take that one, and the best answer I can give you is kind of vague because it depends. Uh, it changes from year to year, building to building, floor to floor even. Um, with larger communities, there tends to be more activity, so Campion tends to stay pretty busy, um, versus Xavier is smaller, tends to be quieter, so it kind of depends on what kind of culture um, or what kind of experience you're looking for. Um, in my experience, I've seen floors that are super duper quiet. You could hear a pin drop because we just have a quiet batch of students up there who really prefer to stream in their rooms or not really engage a ton. I've also had other floors that are rowdy and super close knit. And so it truly, truly depends. Um, and if you find yourself landing on a floor and you're looking for a different experience, talk to your RA. Looks like Tyler got the question in the chat. Um, next question is, how often do we do fire drills or earthquake drills? Is it usually in the day or around night? Um, fire drills, um, we do, I'll get to the earthquake drill in just a moment, but for fire drills, typically around once a quarter um, in, re in accordance with um, federal law, I believe it is. Um, and we try to shoot four times where the most students are um, around and able to participate. And so it does vary um, when we do fire drills. But what I would offer for you is that when the fire alarm is going off, please don't just assume that it's a drill. Um, regardless, if, if the fire alarm is going off, you are expected to vacate the building. If there is for any reason an issue that you run into where you can't vacate the building safely, uh, we, like, we will make sure you have the Department of Public Safety phone number and we will make sure that you connect with them. As far as earthquake earthquake drills, we do what's called the Great Shakeout every so often, um, though I am blanking on how often we do the Great Shakeout. Uh, Tyler, do you recall? Yeah, it's at least twice an academic year. Cool, awesome, thank you. Next question, uh, are students allowed to apply for job positions as resident assistants? If so, are freshmen allowed to apply? I love this question. Uh, short answer, um, the. For answer for the first part of your question is yes. Um, we do an annual hiring process for our student staff, inclusive of our resident assistants, our desk assistants and such. Um, and so you will start seeing um, recruitment um, efforts for that at the tail end of fall quarter. Um, first year students are able to apply during their first year here. So you wouldn't be able to apply prior to being here as you need to have lived had experience living on campus before you can apply. If the meal plan we chose isn't enough or too much, where can you go to change it? If I'm not mistaken, that's in the housing portal, right, Tyler? Yes, um, you will be able to make that change on the housing portal if you wish to do so. All right, awesome, thank you. If we had already selected a ranking for res halls when filling out the housing application, are we able to switch it now or after selecting a roommate? Ooh, I'm gonna hand that to over to Tyler. Yeah, so the answer to that is yes to both. Uh, now or after selecting a roommate. So uh, if you if you want to go back and change your preferences, you can do that. Uh, you need to reopen your completed housing application. And uh, one of the options that will be available to you is update application. So you can click on that and go back in and update whatever page you're trying to update. Um, and that will override whatever preferences that you had previously. Um, and then if you select a roommate, you get your housing assignment, and then you want to change a residence hall to somewhere else, you're able to submit, I believe Katie mentioned this, um, we call it a room change request on the housing portal. Uh, we do process those based on space availability, and it's a little bit harder to change once we have already assigned everyone. Not impossible, but just a little bit, a little bit harder to do. Um, so you're welcome to still submit a room change request after that, um, and we will process if we have the space to do so. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for taking that one. And the last question in the chat is, what is the great shakeout like? I'm coming from a state with no earthquakes, so I am clueless. I am also from a state with no er earthquakes as I am from Arizona, I hear you. Um, and the great shakeout, um, you will receive an email from the Department of Public Safety saying like on this date at these two different times, um, it's for what it is, it's pretty low key um, where you're instructed to um, whatever you're doing, just get below a desk um, or somewhere safe where there's something over your head and you'll hang out for, I believe it's 90 seconds. Because in the event of an earthquake, the safest thing for you to do is to get low to the ground and under a desk 
Um, cause it's not the shaking that will hurt you. It's things that fall as a result of the shaking should an earthquake occur. Um, and so we do, um, the shake out twice a quarter. You will be well informed in advance of when that's happening. Um, and once you are enrolled at Seattle university, you will automatically be enrolled on your phone, um, in what's called Omni alert, which is our uh, text alert system through the department of public safety. So you will also receive text saying the shakeout has begun, please get somewhere safe. Um, and you will receive a text message when, okay, we're good. Shakeout is done. Thank you for your participation. Any other questions? Do you have any items that are often forgot about that you feel like are good to bring to the dorms? I personally would recommend a small electric fan. Um, if you live on one of the upper floors of the buildings, it can get toasty during the uh, beginning of fall and tail end of spring. Um, and so we do see students um, mail ordering fans and um, AC units, which I just, word to the wise, um, AC units typically are not allowed in within the residence halls, mainly for wattage related reasons. So small electric fans, best bet. I'll know what you think, Tyler. Anything you would recommend? Yeah, um, I think a fan is definitely something. <laughs> um, I think also sometimes students forget items to bring related to the bathrooms. So you're definitely going to want to bring like a little shower caddy. So you're not like holding all of your like shampoo and body wash and everything that you need in your arms. So definitely getting a shower caddy, something that is water resistant that you can like have in the shower with you. Um, another thing too, shower sandals, right? That's something that you're, that you're going to want to have as well. Um, so really anything related to bathroom usage, you're going to want to remember to bring, uh, not forget it before you get here. Yeah. And last question in the chat, what time of the day does the fitness center close or open? Does it vary on the quarter slash the sport going on at the time? Um, best answer I can give you is that it does vary, but the our rec center um, routinely sends out emails to students saying, hey, here are hours for the quarter, here are our hours during the breaks. Um, and you can also go to the Seattle U website and look up, it's U-R-E-C, the U rec, and you can find the hours from there. Yeah, and just to add on to that, so the UREC or University Recreation Center, it's not actually affiliated with the athletics department. So if a if a certain sport is not in season and there's nothing really going on at that time, it won't have any impact on the hours of operation for the, the rec center because that is for the entire campus community. It's it's separate from athletics. So um, any hours of operation are independent from the athletics department. Great, so um, we will wait for a couple more minutes to see if anyone has any other questions. Oh, looks like we got one more. Um, are the washers and dryers in high demand during move-in? Um, I... Right at move-in, I would probably say no, um, not super in high demand because everyone is coming with washed clothes um, or new clothes. If you're you know, like me, I've moved here from Las Vegas and I didn't really have a rain jacket. So I went and bought a rain jacket, which is new. Um, so I would say no. However, probably two to three weeks into the quarter, that's when you're going to see a little bit higher usage. Um, not to the point where you can't get a washer or dryer because, you know, students are going to be used to their schedules. Um, so some people may do laundry really early in the morning or some people may do it at lunch or in the evening or late at night. So they're open 24 or 7. Um, so really, when, whenever it's convenient for students to do that, they, they do. Um, so I would probably say a little bit in uh, two to three weeks into the quarter, you'll see higher usage. But right at move in, you really shouldn't have a problem. I would add one more thing onto that. Um, in addition to why washers and dryers usually be in higher demand near the end of each quarter. Um, should you ever experience an issue with a washer or driver, please let the front desk know. Um, I Something that I observe is that um, a lot of students will see a broken down machine and assume we already know about it when sometimes we don't. Um, and so if you ever see that, like 
go to the front desk and say, hey, this washer with this number, I noticed this issue um, and we'll submit a report on your behalf. Next question is, what is the shower situation like? Um, if I'm, a, I'm, I'm gonna interpret this as though you mean just like the general like setup of the showers. Um, Xavier, Bellarmine and Campion are all traditional style halls, uh, meaning that you all share a bathroom um, or you will share a bathroom on that floor. Um, and so you can expect a shower stall type setup um, with, I believe in, um, I can't speak to Bellarmine or Xavier, but I know in Campion, we have a couple curtains, uh, two curtains specifically um, for privacy with each shower stall. So you go in, shut one curtain, there's a little counter for you to set your stuff. And then um, in further into the shower, second curtain, and then there's the spigot with the water handle. Um, if, if you're hoping to learn something different, please let me know. Um, but yeah, it's a basic shower stall. How do the medical services work? Uh, how hard is it to get an appointment? So it sounds like you're asking about our student health center. Um, and to set up an appointment, it is as simple as giving them a call and saying, uh, telling the person, hey, I'm hoping to set, schedule an appointment to be seen for this, and they'll work with you from there. It's typically pretty easy to get in from what I understand. How many people typically share one bathroom? So it varies from building to building on how many people are on your floor. Um, I'll speak to Campion specifically, where there's typically about 50 to 60-ish residents, it kind of depends. Um, and there's two bathrooms on the floor. Um, and so uh, if you're on a co-ed floor, one male, one female. If you're on an all-female floor, there are two female restrooms, um, which sounds like a lot for the bathroom. And I understand that something to keep in mind is that not everyone is trying to use the bathroom at once. Um, and as you get through, go through the quarter, you kind of get a sense for your hallmates routines as well. So you're not bumping into each other and trying to shower at the same time. But um, we have enough shower stalls, enough toilet stalls to support the amount of people that are living on that floor. To reserve a study room, do we just go down to the front desk downstairs? Um, you can reserve a study room, um, but typically it is first come first serve um, on, within the residence halls. How many toilet stalls and shower stalls are in each bathroom? I believe that varies from building to building. Um, I believe in Campion specifically, each bathroom is going to have two to three of each. Uh, in each bathroom in Campion, there's two to three shower stalls, depending on which side the restroom is on. All right, we have about five more minutes in our virtual time here together. So any last minute questions, we're happy to answer. Again, this uh, session has been recorded. So if you wanna share it with others that you know couldn't be here or wanna watch it again and uh, maybe some more questions may come up after watching it a second time, you're more than welcome to reach out to us. Um, we will go ahead and put our contact information for the department in our chat. Uh, you're always welcome to call us or email us, housing at seattleu.edu. Um, we, we do strive to get you a same day response by email. So, um, or at least 24 hours if you're emailing us right at 4.30 when we close. Um, so please, please, we encourage you to reach out with all of your questions. We, we love answering questions. We understand that this is new and different. So we're here to help um, answer any questions that you may have between now and September. But any last minute questions here, we are welcome, you are welcome to ask and we will answer. All right, well, um, it doesn't look like we have any other questions added in our chat. Uh, Katie and I will stick around until uh, 5.30, the official end time for this webinar series session. Um, but for those of you who want to log off, thank you again so much for being here. We appreciate you making the time to learn more about housing and the Red Hawk residential experience. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and we will see you in September. We are busy preparing for your arrival. We're getting everything ready for move in. So we hope to share the same excitement in a couple of months with you all. Have a good night, everyone.